Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and Merry Christmas. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and it's my joy to welcome you to The Vine for this week. The Vine is our online campus for the Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And we're so glad that you've joined us for worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent. We do have some special services coming up to celebrate Christmas. On Christmas Eve, we'll have five live Christmas Eve services here in the sanctuary. The first two at 11 a.m. and at 2 p.m. will be for the children, lessons and carols for children and families. And then the next three services, which will be at 3.30, 5, and 7.30, uh, these will be the traditional candlelight Christmas Eve communion services. And we hope that you'll join us for live service, or you can also worship with us on Christmas Eve uh, by means of uh, watching the service on the vine as well. And then on Christmas morning, uh, we will have one service that will be at 10 a.m., the live service. It will be live streamed on Facebook, and then it will be uploaded later in video format for you to watch on YouTube if you're not able to catch it that morning. So we hope that you'll help us keep Christ first in Christmas by worshiping with us uh, next weekend for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Once again, welcome to our worship service today. And let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We continue in worship now with our morning prayer. And all this month we've been praying together an Advent prayer in unison. I invite you to join with me in praying this prayer together now. The words will be on the screen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us that the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Grant that we may always be found watching for the coming of your Son. You so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Help us to feel your presence with us always, and may our lives show in every word and deed your great love for the world. We confess that we are not always willing to see the light and to walk in your ways. We ask that the Spirit of Christ be born anew within us, that our hearts may be stirred to glorify the birth of Jesus with words of witness and acts of compassion and service. Through Jesus our Lord we pray. Amen. I'm Pastor David, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And uh, we're here to light the Advent candle for the fourth Sunday of Advent, my wife Binky and our granddaughter Aubrey Reiner. A reading from Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45. You have heard that it, is, it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous. We light this candle as a symbol of the Father's love. May the love of the Father shown in Christ lead us to the way of salvation. Okay. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel.
Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to get to lead us in prayer this morning. Will you join me now in prayer? We thank you, God, for gathering us together today. We thank you that even when we are apart physically, your spirit can unite us. Thank you for your love that is better than life. Jesus, while we await your coming yet again, this is our prayer. We want more of you, Lord. We are desperate to feel your presence with us. We need to be restored by your love. We want more of you in the tedium of our day-to-day -day lives, more of you around our dinner tables and in our carpool lines, in our meetings and our conversations. We want more of you in the world, in all the broken and dark corners that feel hopeless. God, fit us for heaven. Free us from the bondage of self so that we can do your will. Help us to choose to follow you over and over in the little decisions we make each day. Transform us so that we can be part of the transformation of the world. We pray today for the sick and the suffering. We pray for those with physical ailments and for those who are suffering invisibly with their mental health. We pray for the poor and for victims of violence and injustice. And God, we pray for those we are specifically concerned about today. And we name them before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. We thank you, God, that you hear our prayers and that you care. We thank you that it is your good pleasure to give us all we need. Trusting in your unfailing love, we pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we move now into a time of reflection and giving, I'd just like to remind you that you can always give to the mission of Wrightsville United Methodist Church through our website, our app, or the mail. Let us now continue to worship God.
Wrightsville kids, I'm Pastor Julia. And today I brought with me a picture that I want to show you. This is one of my favorite, favorite pictures. I have this hanging up in my office. Now, do you have any idea who this might be a picture of? Well, this person is, has a pregnant belly and is wearing a blue scarf. And this one doesn't seem to be wearing any clothes, but she has an apple. I think it's Mary, who's Jesus's mom, and Eve from the Old Testament, the first woman ever. Adam was her husband, Adam and Eve. What else do you notice about this picture? What do you think that the people are feeling in this picture? I think Eve looks really sad and kind of embarrassed. But Mary, Mary looks peaceful. She looks like she's telling Eve that everything's going to be okay. You know, this picture is about the fact that Eve made a really big mistake. God had told her that she wasn't supposed to eat fruit from one particular tree, and she did it anyway. And I think that she felt really bad about that afterwards. Do you ever do something that you know you're not supposed to do, but somehow you kind of find yourself doing it anyway? I do too. That can be really hard, and I always feel really bad afterwards. But Mary is telling Eve that everything's going to be okay. Because you see, Mary in this picture is pregnant with the baby Jesus. And Jesus comes to free us from all of those bad things. Jesus forgives us when we make all of those mistakes. And he helps us to do what we're supposed to do instead so that we don't have as many of those yucky times when we do something we know we're not supposed to do and feel yucky afterwards. So I want you to remember this week, and especially at Christmas, that when you make a mistake, it's okay. You know, sometimes we, we do things and we feel bad, but because of Jesus, it's okay. God still loves us so much and God helps us to do the right thing in the future. I hope that you guys like this picture as much as I do. Will you say a prayer with me now? God, thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for forgiving us and telling us that it's okay when we do the wrong thing. And thank you for helping us to do the right thing instead. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's the fourth Sunday of Advent, or what we might call the last Sunday before Christmas. And so it's getting close. We continue our work through the prophet Isaiah, who foretells of the coming of the Messiah. And so we're going to pick up today in chapter 7, verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, you have promised to be with us. Be with us in this moment that we might hear your voice. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sure enough, next Sunday's Christmas. 
I'd like to give us a little preview this morning because the Christmas story is really a story unmatched in its beauty, its power, and I might say its mystery. Christmas is first of all about a young couple who experience the miraculous in their life. Mary's with child, a child conceived by the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah just now we read, Here now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of the people? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know, I'm a 51-year-old college-educated man who was raised in the church by two parents who were also college graduates. To me, faith and science have never really ever been in conflict. I believe there are certain truths in the physical world, and I believe in a God who can do miracles that can supersede those truths. For example, I know where babies come from, and yet I have no problem believing in the virgin birth as well. My God is not limited by the universe that he created. Nevertheless, I still get surprised when something defies science. For instance, I recently ran across an article that was meant to surprise me, and it succeeded. It seems that after having two children, Fran Castro of Townsville, North Carolina, up near Carr Lake, decided to have a tubal ligation. She and her husband, Mo had decided that their two daughters, Jessica and Cherie, then ages five and three, were enough. But the next year, Fran was sitting at the dining room table when she felt something move inside of her. Mo, if I didn't know better, she told him, I'd swear I just felt a baby kick. You know that's not possible, he replied. That's what Fran thought until she went to the doctor. Five months later, she gave birth to the couple's third daughter, Christy. So Mo decided to get a vasectomy. After the procedure, he confidently told Fran, now there's no chance of us ever having more children. And he was right. For a while. Until Fran started having the telltale signs of pregnancy again. No, it couldn't be, she thought. Out of curiosity, she decided to buy a home pregnancy test and was completely shocked when the result was positive. Several months later, Fran gave birth to a healthy baby boy. I've never delivered a baby where the mother has had a tubal ligation and the father's had a vasectomy, said Fran's physician, James Goodwin, M.D. The odds of both procedures failing must be astronomical. He added, all I can say is that this baby was destined to be here. And the Castros felt that way too. In fact, they named him Destin. In their own way, the Castros were as mystified by this turn of events as were Mary and Joseph on that very first Christmas. Mary and Joseph had a son who was destined to be here. They named him Jesus, just as Joseph had been told to name him in a dream. You see, Christmas is a story of a young couple who experience the miraculous in their life. But Christmas is also a story of extraordinary love and trust. Joseph was startled to learn of Mary's condition, as you might imagine. At first, he had second thoughts about their impending marriage. He didn't want to humiliate Mary publicly. He was a good man, and he loved her too much for all of that. So he resolved to end the relationship quietly. Joseph's emotions remind me of something that happened to Mark Maurer of Hilton Head, South Carolina. For some reason, Mark was in the doghouse with his wife, and he wanted to make amends, so he ordered her some flowers and told the florist that the card should read, I'm sorry, comma, I love you. Unfortunately, his instructions must not have been clear enough. When the flowers arrived, there was no comma. The card simply read, I'm sorry, I love you. That's a good way to make a bad situation worse. But that's probably how Joseph felt at first. Sorry that he loved Mary. It was too much to ask him to believe that this child had somehow been mysteriously conceived. But then something quite disturbing happened to Joseph. He had a dream. An angel appeared to him and confirmed Mary's story that indeed the child which she would bear had been conceived by the Holy Spirit. And that's all Joseph needed was this dream. 
My guess is Joseph loved Mary very much and trusted her. And Joseph also loved God and trusted him too. How else do you explain the readiness with which he accepts Mary's story? Most men would have said, ah, it's just a dream. Nothing's really changed. Not Joseph. Joseph believed in God. And Joseph believed in the one chosen to be his wife. You see, Christmas is a story of extraordinary love and trust. How fortunate people are to experience that kind of a relationship. Some of you are old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis some 60 years ago. For those who aren't familiar with this important event, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union sent nuclear missiles on ships to be set up in Cuba so that they would be closer to the United States in case of war. However, American ships interrupted the Soviet ships, excuse me, I should say intercepted the Soviet ships, and with an agreement that the Americans would not attack newly communist Cuba, the Soviets agreed to take their missiles back to Russia. Probably the closest we ever came to actual nuclear war. A story in the New York Times gives us an interesting footnote to that crisis. At that same time, some 2,000 of the most important people in the government were issued laminated passes with gold wire threaded through their ID photos to prevent counterfeiting. These imposing cards provided entry in the event of a national emergency to an alternate seat of government, a cavernous nuclear bomb shelter dug into the rural Virginia countryside. Among the windowless offices stretching down its long fluorescent corridors were quarters for the Supreme Court. And among the passes were nine for each of the justices. But when officials came to the court to give Chief Justice Earl Warren his pass, he had a soft question, for he did not notice a pass for Mrs. Warren. Well, uh, there's not room for um, wives, he was told. Only very important people. Well, in that case, he said, now you have room for another VIP. And smiling, he handed his pass back. Earl Warren wasn't going anywhere without his wife. Undoubtedly, Joseph had the same level of commitment to Mary. How fortunate people are who have that level of love and trust. Christmas is a celebration of a young couple who discover the miraculous in their lives, and Christmas is a celebration of extraordinary love and trust. But much more important than either of these, Christmas is the entrance of God into human experience. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means to deliver, to save, or to rescue. All this took place, says the Gospel of Matthew, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. What an amazing thought. The very God of the universe is in our midst. The manger in Bethlehem cradles a king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And amazingly, few who actually encountered him had any idea who he actually was. Reminds me of a delightful story about William Lawrence Bragg. At 25, the youngest person ever to win the Nobel prize for physics. Bragg, you see, was an avid amateur gardener on top of being an amazing um, person, a scientist in physics. When he moved to London to head the Royal Institution, he reluctantly left behind the beautiful Cambridge garden he'd spent so many years perfecting. Life in a city apartment made him restless and unhappy until he found an ingenious solution to his problem. Dressed in old gardening clothes with a spade over one shoulder, he patrolled the streets of a nearby wealthy district until he found a house whose garden tempted him. So he rang the bell and tipping his hat respectfully to the lady of the house, introduced himself simply as Willie, 
an odd job gardener with one free afternoon a week. His employer found Willie to be an absolute treasure. Until at last, one day, a knowledgeable visitor looked out through her window and gasped, Good heavens, what is Sir Lawrence Bragg doing in your garden? In a similar fashion, you and I might gasp, What is God doing in a stable? But that's the contention that Christians make. That the God of all creation humbled himself and took upon human flesh. It's an extraordinary claim. That's a stumbling block to many people. But how would you do it if you were God? How would you communicate with human beings without overpowering them or violating the principle of human free will? God's plan is brilliant in its simplicity. God would live among us and reveal himself to a small group of common folk who would tell others what God had done in their lives. Then they, in turn, would tell others what they had experienced and as the story of God's coming is told over and over again, humanity would be one. Not with dramatic signs that would leave people unable to resist, but with gentle love, like the love of a baby laid in a manger. How else could God reveal himself in all his completeness except to come to us incarnate, that is to say, in human flesh? It reminds me of an exchange I had with my grandmother, Snotherly, before she passed in 2005. She grew up before the age of television, but before she died, she saw the beginnings of the digital age. In her last years, she lived in a retirement home that had a computer station, kind of like what you might see at a public library. And she became very interested in the Internet. She kept hearing about the Internet on TV, and my mom would tell her about all the things you could do with it. You could email your grandchildren. You could receive pictures. You could read the news. You could watch videos. Everything was at your fingertips. You could learn so much simply by typing in a question. Well, that all sounded great to my grandmother. The only thing was that when she went to the computer station, she didn't know how to access the Internet. How do you get there? How do you set up an email account? Once on the World Wide Web, how would you find your way around? So one Christmas, while we were all over at my parents' house, she started asking me all these questions. And naturally, as a good grandson, I took her to my parents' home computer and showed her how it all worked. She said, this is actually really easy. I said, it sure is. She said, you know, there are actually written instructions at the computer station back at my home, but I guess I just needed someone to show me. Just like when God gave the gift of salvation, he didn't send a booklet of complicated instructions for us to figure out. Instead, he sent his son to show us. A young couple experiences the miraculous in their lives. A humble husband shows extraordinary love and trust. And God enters in to the human experience. Kind of breathtaking, isn't it? No wonder the whole town's lit up. No wonder everyone's singing carols. It's the most beautiful story in all the world. It's Christmas time, and all the world awaits the coming of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Gracious Father, who gives us all things, you even gave us your Son in order to save the world, including each one of us. Lord, help us to see the miraculous in our own lives. Help us to experience a trusting and loving relationship, even if it's not to us. May we be the one who shares it with another. And Lord, help us to see where you have entered into humanity so that we might have eternal life with you. It's in Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.
fourth one, peace. To experience miracles. To share love and trust with others. And to see where God is at work in our world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May you run and not be weary. May your heart be filled with song. May the love of God continue to give you hope and keep you strong. And may you run and not be weary. May your life be filled with joy. And may the road you travel always lead you home.